Welcome yeah. to Exits, Exits, Exits. Uh, this is obviously a work of fiction. <laughs> uh, we have a, uh, the purpose of the panel is to draw uh, out some of the distinctions between the exit environment and processes in the US and the UK. And we have a great panel for that. Um, Jigger Shaw, who's sitting right here, is the CEO of Carbon War Room, who is a, sort of a multinational entrepreneur. <laughs> um, uh, Hans Peter Bronno, who is a Norwegian living in the U.S. for the last 20 years, now resident in Berlin, having sold his company to a Finnish company. <laughs> so don't ask me to explain that. <laughs> Uh, Julie Ferris over here is a serial entrepreneur, uh, a lot of it in the uh, email and messaging space, and is more recently spending a lot of her time doing angel investing and serving on boards of directors and advisory boards. Uh, Hugh is an investment banker uh, who admitted that he went to Oxford in the last <laughs> um, So we taken him off the moderator list. <laughs> <laughs> on the Toby Fenn, who runs G2 Energy in the U.S., and Sophie McGrath, who is with uh, what was originally a U.S. law firm, but from her accent, I think grew up here in Britain. Um, and I'm Alan Morgan. I'm a, uh, an investor in the U.S. Uh, I spend part of my time investing with a venture fund called Mayfield and part of my time investing as an angel investor on my own. Um, the, to start, I guess I would ask Hugh maybe to give a bit mm -hmm. of an overview of, uh, from his perspective of the current state of the exit environment in the UK. Sophie, I assume you're a corporate lawyer and you can chime in as well. And then we'll turn to uh, Hans Peter, who's actually recently had an exit where he sold a US company that he founded called Plum to Nokia. Uh, great, thank you, Alan. Uh, so the exit environment in the UK now is a, a little bit of a bare desert. Uh, I mean, there really is uh, two things going on, either highly distressed businesses that are, have, were venture-backed and are no longer venture-backed looking for exits, uh, and of course there are a large number of high-quality businesses that are desperately trying not to get themselves sold in this market. I think what you're finding if you're in the corporate development groups at, at the big buyer communities, uh, the big corporates in, uh, in the US, in the technology sector, or across Europe and Asia, is that you have a huge stack of companies that you need to sift through in order to find uh, the icing on the cake. And most of those businesses are distressed. Uh, and so if you look at the M&A data, at least across Europe, although you see a relatively solid number of transactions the value of, every, of each transaction has absolutely collapsed. And that's because you're having a large number of businesses that are sold for a dollar or ten dollars or, or just sold if you can cover the costs of the running costs of the business over the next six to twelve months. So I think for, for high quality businesses it's absolutely a, a time to focus on building the company and, a, and not a time to raise your hand in the air and say, hey listen, you know, we're up for sale. Uh, I mean, many on the panel would argue there's never a time to do that anyway, even in the best of markets. So uh, I think it's a very difficult time if you're forced to sell your business. Uh, we did some very distressed work at the beginning of the year, and it's a dirty business. You get to the end of the process and nobody's happy. Mm -hmm. And certainly as an advisor, so if you I'm sure can comment on that, you know, you get to the end of uh, a pretty brutal three or four month process and, you know, everybody disappears uh, off to do their next big thing. So... Uh, I think it's a very, very tough market. Uh, a couple of good exits recently in the digital media space, AdMob and here in Europe uh, with uh, Playfish, which is exciting, but it's, it's early days to say there's any sort of recovery, in my view. Yeah, I think so. We would support. I, I do a lot of work in the venture capital area, normally on the inbound side, so I do a lot of investment work. But also then we stay with those companies and watch them exit. Um, as Hugh says, there's not a lot of good exit stories at the moment. There are a lot of bad ones. Um, a lot of companies that have gone into administration or liquidation. So you're seeing there either the sale of a company as a going concern in administration, but for a very, very low valuation. Or sometimes you see the administrator trying to recover the assets. But we're not seeing the type of exits that you would ideally want to see if you're a venture-backed company, which is a positive exit where you as the founder 
and your investors and making a return on your money, a multiple hopefully. Um, where we are seeing exits that are for value, uh, the structure of the deal is very different to what we were seeing three years ago. We're seeing that people will pay a small amount of the consideration up front, but they want to defer as much as possible. And often that means that a large proportion of the consideration is being deferred for one or two or three years after the actual sale, and it's linked to milestones. So that's very different to what you're seeing a couple of years ago where you had competitive auctions. So a company who wanted to be sold could say, could go and pimp itself out to you know, five different buyers and, and go for the highest valuation. So I think it, the landscape of exits, um, particularly M&A, has changed uh, fundamentally. Hopefully there'll be a recovery and we'll go back to the glory days of, uh, of the auction. But That's Peter, why don't, both with respect to Plum, but also more broadly, you're pretty deeply embedded in the sort of Silicon Valley entrepreneur's ecosystem. Can you give us a comment of what you're seeing and feeling and hearing? Uh, yeah. Um, so I, I think I think what's being said and sort of the doom and gloom is uh, there's some truth to it, um, a fair amount of truth to it. Um, I, I do think that it's not the full truth um, or the full picture. Um, I'm not calling you liars. Um, <laughs> but it I, just does sound like that. I think. <laughs> um, I, I think, let me tell you my, my kind of personal journey for the last 12 months, and, and, uh, and it won't take 12 months to tell the story, but I, I, I'll give you a brief summary just to kind of give you some flavor of, of how we got to where we ended up. Um, I had a board meeting in October of last year, and at that board meeting I sat down and I said, look, we have three options. We, uh, just a very briefly on the company, uh, I'd started it three and a half years earlier. We had had some success, but we weren't a rocket ship. We weren't the next YouTube yet. We weren't the next Twitter yet. Uh, but we, and we also had a product roadmap and some ideas based on the learnings that we had made that we were very bullish and excited about. We had supportive investors, but they weren't supportive in the sense that you know they would write very big checks. They would keep us going. Uh, they didn't want us to die, but they weren't prepared to, in this market, to put big capital into the company. So I was faced with three options. I could shut the business down in an orderly manner before we ran out of cash, um, and basically recognize that it would take too much capital to bring it to the next level. I could try to raise capital. The original plan had been, you know, this was October of last year, was, would have, was to have gone out in, in, in January, or I could sell the company. And uh, I had, at the time, I had capital to last me into sort of the mid-late uh, spring, so call it April, May. Um, and what I did was I made structural changes to the business so that we would reduce our, including across the board salary cuts, uh, so that we would re reduce our run, uh, increase our runway. And then I sat down with the, my board and I said, look, these are the three options. Um, and my recommendation is we sell the company. And I made a very clear distinction between any one of these options. And I said, we can, we can pursue one. And either one is a risky option. And I then very deliberately went out and spent the next 12 months working uh, the leads that I had and, and the opportunities I had discovered to sell the company. We had a very successful outcome from my perspective at the end. You know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a $100 million deal, but it was, I think everybody looked at it and said, this is, this is the right thing to do for the business. But, you know, it was, it was we took a risk. We'd made a decision, and we went, we, 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 we chose a path, and it took us almost 12 months to get the deal done. Nokia, by the way, at the time, had a moratorium, a global moratorium on M&A. So technically, they weren't doing deals, which meant that when there was a hot one in the, in the, in the popper, um, what uh, what what base what they ended up doing was putting their entire M and A teams, as they had nothing else to do, on the deal. Mm -hmm. So it was me solo negotiating against the head of M and A at Nokia and his 17 disciples and the entire legal department. <laughs> and you know, we, I literally walk into meetings with 12 Nokia people and myself, and we'd be sitting down there having negotiations, which is one of the reasons it took a while. But we 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 got the deal done, and we got it done because we had strong internal support in in the business unit that ultimately did the deal, which is ba Berlin based. And the business leader there was behind it, and he had some clout. So I think you know we can get into questions and discussions afterwards. But I think the the there are ways to get deals done today. But I think it's it is a very different landscape than it was, and it takes a very deliberate effort. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you are the next Twitter, and most of you won't be. I'm sorry. Uh, it, you know you, you will you will have to work 
making something happen very differently than I think you might have in, you know, at, at these sort of peak moments in, in the industry. Uh, but but it can still it can still get done. It doesn't have to be a liquidation, you know, to get it done. Uh, very briefly, um, actually, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Was there? I have one question. It, was there a difference in Nokia's approach that derived from its sort of status as a non-U.S. company, or did you find differences between U.S. companies and companies based elsewhere, or was it idiosyncratic to, to Nokia that they had a particular need that Plum filled? Do you think? That, that, that's a very good question. I, I have sold uh, uh, two prior businesses in the U.S. Um, and uh, this was my first sale to, to, to a European or to, to, a, to an international, multinational, really. And uh, I, I think I, th I think that there, there are some subtle differences, but at the end of the day, you know, it was a global corporation. Most of the M&A guys were actually New York and, and, and you know, U.S. based. Uh, the, 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 I think the biggest difference is my observation is that in Europe, relationships tend to matter, and I'm making a broad generalization here, but I think relationships tend to matter a little bit more than they do in the U.S. Mm -hmm. I think the U.S. is a little bit more Darwinistic, a little bit just more pure kind of capitalist principles. I think relationships over here matter a little bit more. And I had built relationships within Nokia for two years that led up to the final uh, acquisition, and that was incredibly helpful, not because it was dealing, but because it gave me channels of communication. Now again, you have to do, I mean, I have those relationships at Google, I have those relationships in other places as well, and I tried to pursue them there as well, but there's something about the personal relationship in Europe that somehow matters a little bit different. I, I can't quite put my finger on it, but there's a different dynamic there than, than what I find in the US. Uh, it's a little bit of a vague answer, but I'll see if I can articulate it clear, more clearly by the end of the discussion. What, um, I have a, a question for anyone on the panel who has, uh, wants to comment. The, in the U.S., um, the principal historical uh, market on which startups went public was, is the NASDAQ. And we've now just finished the worst 10 years in the history of NASDAQ for certain technology IPOs, I believe IPOs in general. Um, we don't have a market like the AIM market in the U.S., and I'd be interested, anybody who has on the panel experience, whether AIM is a success or a failure or vibrant or not worth much discussion. Uh, I'm, so, I'm certainly happy to chip in. I feel I've already had a, I've already had a crack at this, though. But I don't know if, uh, any of you guys want to speak up. But, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I think... Uh, you know, NASDAQ kind of shot itself in the foot. Uh, I mean, the timing was very unfortunate when they launched into Sarbanes-Oxley because not only did, uh, did companies start to struggle to get the sorts of growth that investors were looking for, but in addition to that, they then had to jump through in innumerable hoops in order to get their companies onto the stock market. And it, I think it cost something like 2 to $3 million to, to deal with Sarbanes-Oxley, which is a compliance procedure to get your company. Per year. Per, per year, okay. <laughs> And, and, yeah. and more than that, up front, <clears throat> just to comply. So that's, uh, in, in, in reality, it's a great opportunity for some of the smaller markets here in Europe. Um, I think all of those markets today are having a very, a very tough time, just like NASDAQ. Uh, but the regulatory environment is uh, much more relaxed. That clearly has some disadvantages in the boom times, and I think we've certainly seen that on AIM, where you've had a large number, in, in some cases, venture-backed businesses, that have, uh, that have floated without the, the corporate governance structures and the operational structures that you need to be a public company. And the challenge, of course, if you do that and your share price comes off, is that in a, in a small market like AIM, let's say you have a market cap of 50 or $100 million, there is no liquidity. And by that I mean there is no people interested in buying and selling your shares. Uh, and the result of that, of course, is that the share price tumbles. You, you as a young company, of course, uh, aren't protected in the private environment from the, from, the glare of pub, uh, from the glare of publicity. And so as a result of that, I think uh, uh, many, many companies, very good technology companies that are not yet profitable, are languishing mm. on these markets all across Europe with uh, no interest from the venture community to take them private because it's too much hassle, basically, and uh, no real interest from the institutional investors to invest in a small-cap business. So 
Uh, I think there will be a lot of, lot of opportunity coming back, and I think we'll all benefit from the fact that institutional investors and fund managers uh, have very, very short-term memories. And, uh, you know, we'll, we will, I'm sure, see a, a resurgence of, uh, of interest in small-cap public companies, but probably not for a year or two yet. Let me actually turn actually... the question I was going to ask for, oh, for you and Toby to comment if, if there is a difference in the sort of clean tech energy marketplaces than in high tech. Well, if you don't mind, um, I just... Just to follow on you's answer. No, on I'm AIM running the show. And you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Um, we looked at actually listing on the AIM, and um, Solar Integrated Technologies was on the AIM um, for a number of years. I think they went public in 04, I think, or 04, 05 on the AIM. Um, and I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, I think Mickey, who was my host last night, uh, um, um, you know, as an MBA student, um, it was from Nomura Securities, and she said that her job after, night after Sarbanes Oxley passed was to get people to list on the Japanese mm. stock exchange from the U.S. and um, <laughs> and she didn't get any takers. But um, <laughs> um, but um, that's why she's doing an MBA. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, I, I think that I mean the challenge really is is that you know the liquidity of the market is 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 critical and um, and you know for a company like ours, which is an infrastructure company, we if we would have gone public, we would have raised. $300 million a year for 10 years probably um, in the public markets every year and, until our growth rate actually came down to you know, something more reasonable where you actually are cash flow positive. And, um, and it, it's just brutal doing that on a, a small exchange and so we decided against doing that. And even the ones that are on the AIM I think that I know of like, you know, are trying to get to the NASDAQ um, because there's more um, liquidity there. But, uh, but you want to talk about the clean tech stuff? Well, I'll, I'll try to answer the question as far as uh, clean tech. Um, the business I'm in now and other businesses that I've started and sold, um, they didn't have the pressure that a lot of the technology businesses that the rest of the folks are talking about had. In other words, I, I never started a business with, the, uh, with a plan to sell that business. And the reason was, in a, in a business like we're in, uh, it cash flows. So we don't have, we're not running out of runway. We always have positive cash flow and we can keep the business forever. It gives you a lot of flexibility, although it's also much less uh, dynamic as far as how much you can get from the business when you ultimately sell. So I, I think that the difference in a, a business like the energy business, which is a capital intensive business, once you have invested that capital, you have a return, you, you have a lot of flexibility to sell the business, uh, present value of those future cash flows, or keep the business and, and just enjoy the returns. So um, it's a, you know, a, a business, that, a, a utility type, type business like we're in is, uh, has much less excitement, but much less risk. Mm. Yeah, that's right. I have a question um, for the panel. Uh, and you're starting to see in the U.S., uh, early attempts to provide um, liquidity, if this makes any sense, private liquidity for private companies. There are a couple of companies, one in New York called Second Market, one uh, in California called Shares Post, in which I'm an investor, that are provided, that provide a private sort of bulletin board marketplace where people who own shares generally in later stage private companies. I think there are 13 or 14 companies on the exchange. Tesla Motors, uh, one of the founders is, well he's not here in this room, but is here with our group. Um, Facebook, Twitter, um, LinkedIn, Slide, and, and several others. And I'm curious uh, whether there's anything similar in the UK. There, th those efforts are still quite small because of the regulatory structure around sales of private securities, there's a lot of friction in the exchanges, so they, they will have to overcome that somehow. But I'm curious whether anyone on the panel sees that as a, uh, a burgeoning, in, in, either in the UK or the US, uh, a, a new way for liquidity to occur that might be helpful. Next we, question. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's unlikely. I mean, I, I, I've been surprised by a lot of things that have happened in tech because of the technological revolution that we've all seen in the last couple of decades. But 
you know, most investors uh, want a lot of disclosure, and mm. th th that what you're describing sounds a little, uh, even though you have some pretty big companies in the exchange, uh, it seems a little uh, hard to imagine that an investor could really get comfortable with that process. In the UK or more broadly in Europe, is there, um, I'm sorry to be standing behind, you guys can continue to look at the audience. There's a voice behind me. This is what it's like to be a venture capitalist. You sit, stand up behind and room over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm curious, are there, if, if you have uh, restricted stock or stock in a private company in the UK, mm. what are your alternatives to sell it if the company's not public, if you can't trade it on the public exchange? Yeah, I mean, I, we'll come to you after the, in a UK private company, it would be fairly usual to have a, what we call preemption on transfer provisions, which basically mean that as a private shareholder in a private company, you can't really sh sell your shares to anyone, um, certainly not an external third party, unless you go through a fairly convoluted process of offering those shares first to your other existing shareholders within the company. And the idea there is that if you have a small privately owned company, you don't want people you don't know being shareholders in your company. Normally your shareholders are fairly strategically chosen people. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it does mean that liquidity for private companies is an issue. We, we have seen uh, uh, in, in Europe a, a kind of copycat from the US, which is uh, a big, big growth in what are called secondary funds. So these are funds that buy assets and companies and portfolios of companies from other investors. And uh, clearly in this market, what you are seeing, uh, uh, I mean, if you look at the UK in particular, 3i, for example, which many of you have will have heard of, uh, decided to exit the venture capital community uh, and in fact closed down their Cambridge office, which is a, a real tragedy. But they sold all in one go their, expo their, their investments in 40 technology companies in the wow. UK mm. to a secondary. So suddenly, as a founder, uh, you raise money from 3i and uh, by hook or by crook, suddenly you have a new owner who doesn't really understand the business and is also managing... 39 other companies that they've just mm. absorbed. So there are, we're definitely seeing a, a shift towards driving for liquidity. In many cases, it's private individuals. In some cases, it's venture capitalists. Uh, but it can create a very uncomfortable situation, mm -hmm. particularly at board level, when suddenly your 30% shareholder does change. And, uh, and I think we're likely to see quite a lot of that still over the next few years, particularly as the VCs go through a process of... Uh, uh, ranking the companies that they've invested in, you know, and they will effectively deploy their capital to the haves and not to the have-nots. So, uh, so yes, I think there is some, some moves afoot in that regard. There was a... Yeah, I was just going to make a quick observation. Um, so I've got a, this is almost sort of for the benefit of the panel, forgive me, I'll be brief. Uh, I've got a couple of companies that have uh, gone public with my name, I'm on the main board here in the UK, and they've uh, both suffered the same problem One thing I'd say on, on our side is that we we went through an extraordinary number of mach machinizations. I mean, Goldman has their own private exchange that we looked at, you know, listing on. We looked at some of these other things, and um, and you know, the conclusion that we came to is that the the whole all the innovations from this sort of dot com um, era, um, one are you know not clear that all of them worked, but second, um, I think are hugely counterproductive. To um, to worker morale on the infrastructure side, 
Um, you know, I mean, this this ability to get, I mean, as Toby was saying in terms of the cash flow for his business, sometimes it's similar in that, you know, I mean, if, if you just harken back to sort of the 80s, you know, and, and the way that workers, you know, at an entrepreneurial company would have thought about, you know, think about Intel or HP or others, you know, or Dell or some of these other companies who ended up being successful. Um, I just think that, you know, it, it's sometimes it's hard to put the genie back in the bottle, but at the same time, it really is hugely disruptive for um, for us to be thinking exits on a lot of these things. Many of these companies really do need to be built from the foundation um, as companies that are go forward companies that are cash flow positive, that can actually meet its obligations going forward, et cetera. And, and the NASDAQ, the fact that NASDAQ never, has never gotten back to, you know, its 1990s high can also be attributed to the fact that that value never really existed. Right. I mean, that that that, right. that you know, and, and for infrastructure companies, that really doesn't happen. I mean, even in the solar industry, which um, their stocks are off, you know, 60 percent from the 2008 highs at the time at which they were at those stock prices in 2008, their P.E. ratios, P.E. ratios, right, because they were earning money. We're, we're still 21 or whatever it was. Right. And then because of the financial crisis and liquidity crises, you know, their profits have come down, and so therefore their stock prices have come down. But they were never really trading at 80 PEs or, you know, whatever they were. Just, just uh, uh, building on that really, really quickly, I, I, I think the point about I mean, e exits, if, if you're thinking about this from an entrepreneur's perspective, you, you never really start a business with an exit in mind, right? I mean, if you do, I, I think your, your, your chance of success is even lower than if you don't. Um, I think you have to think of building a business, but I do think in this climate, and we've touched on this now, you know, an, a, a listing is generally not an exit in any financial sense, nor is it necessarily freeing you up from an operational perspective. I think that's kind of the headline we're hearing here. And from, you know, we were a smaller technology and people acquisition. And what I looked at this as, as did the team, was an entry, not an exit. Yeah. It was an entry into greater opportunity. It was a, an entry into, into, with leverage. Uh, and and yes, there was some financial uh, you know enumeration associated with that. But at the end of the day, I made a decision as to do I want to continue to move on a high risk path, which was getting riskier and riskier with fewer and fewer exit opportunities in a competitive market, or did I want to enter this opportunity, which for the team, for myself, um, and my co-founder was an incredible platform to be able to now do the things that we dreamed about doing at a whole different scale. And, and, and frankly, learn a ton in a, in a you know, in a, in a, a global, a global 68 corporation, right? So there's a, I think the way you frame it as an entrepreneur, how you think about it is, is very important because, you know, sometimes walking away with, without any money, uh, yet having built something of value that you can bring forward is, is, is a significant, is a significant accomplishment. Uh, and, you know, you've learned a ton in the process. And so... I guess the headline is, you know, most companies that get started won't be sold for enormous amounts. Most companies that are successful will be sold, but it won't be for enormous amounts. And I think what you want to do is think about, you know, the ecosystem you operate in and start, as I was alluding to earlier, building relationships with people and, 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 and understanding, because a lot of these exits or entries, if you like, are based on people liking you as the founder and thinking you can have a significant effect on their business and the way they do things. So a lot of it is about relationships, et cetera. So you know, you build a profitable business in the old, the old-fashioned way, right, where you actually make money, um, uh, or, or you know, an infrastructure business. It's one, one thing. If you're building more of a sort of technology innovation business, uh, without necessarily even a very clear business model going into it, kind of what we heard Biz Stone talk about in the last panel around how they think about Twitter. You know, if you're trying more that approach, I, I, I don't think. Uh, I almost wouldn't think of it as an exit. I would think of it as just a continuation. It's just a different way to fund your business and to get leverage.
of stock in the acquiring company. Um, it was a terrible decision. And the reason it was a terrible decision is because it was incredibly defocusing. Because now you had rank and file workers you know, watching the business channel, mm -hmm. worrying about stock price. Well, what's happening with you know, earnings of a, you know, a company that was 100 times bigger than our little piece of the world? They had nothing to do with our metrics, but they were, you know, daily worrying about the stock price. It was going up, everyone was excited, and going out and buying new cars, and it was going down, everybody was, that's all they were talking about. So uh, it was a, a terrible decision. I should have just written everybody a check. Um, it, was a, it would have been a much better uh, uh, use of capital. So that's something to consider if you're, especially if, if you as the owner are selling a business with an earnout, you need all those workers working. You don't need them thinking about what's going on at the acquirer company. Can we take advantage of your acquirer wisdom and all of us a check? <laughs> I'll go, how about some stock in that company? <laughs> <laughs> it's going down. Go ahead. Uh, sort of a generic question, actually. I just wondered, there's one key approach that you take into any sort of deal making or negotiation, uh, particularly as a young entrepreneur, who might not have the sort of... Uh, Let me actually, I just remember when getting the signal that we're recording this, and you need to speak into the microphone, which I had forgotten. Why yes, don't you look aware the, um, the video and audio of this conference is going on YouTube, so you get video as well. Okay, so straight, just straighten your collar. And <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, no, my question was just, is there one key approach that you take into deal-making and negotiation sort of generally, uh, particularly as a young entrepreneur who might not have the sort of grain respect as you walk into a room. Yeah, I was going to say, let's, Julie's actually mm -hmm. been the founder or co-founder or early employee in a whole bunch of startups that have exited through acquisition, so it would be great to get your perspective on that. Um, the, the, the psychology is critical, uh, has been my experience, and, and what I mean by that is um, there's this funny, there's this funny, um, uh, counterintuitive uh, wisdom about this, which is that uh, the best time to be acquired is when you're not looking to be acquired. And if you're looking to be acquired, you just heard a, a, a really good example of a successful outcome uh, that Hans-Peter shared, um, oftentimes it's really hard to get kind of the um, uh, collusion of factors to give you kind of the optimal outcome. And so in terms of being an entrepreneur, one, I think that the, the title of the session is actually a bit unfortunate because I don't think of, it, it suggests that exit is a sort of an end unto itself. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that. I, I, I believe you have liquidity events, which are a path along the way that are ab about how you fund growth in a company until you're self-sustaining. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, but you have sort of the human nature aspect of it, which is, uh, liquidity event means that there's a there's an impact in terms of personal wealth to employees, and so that can be this sort of other folk defocusing thing. And so um, the 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 situations where um, we've had the best outcomes. So I had a company help start a company that was acquired by Netscape in the late 90s. Uh, we were in beta going to market, and the last thing on our mind was to be acquired because the future looked very bright for us. Uh, and Netscape came knocking, and we said, you know, thanks, but no thanks, we're, we're just starting. Uh, and then it became compelling enough that we engaged in the discussions. Uh, the, uh, another company I helped start in the, in the dot-com boom era, uh, we were getting courted by bankers. This was sort of the, the frenzy of the day, we, um, we were pre-revenue, we were getting quartered by bankers to go public. And we kept saying, but wait, we need four quarters of predictable growth. And, and they said, no, 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 the rules have changed. And uh, <laughs> you don't really need revenue. Uh, uh, we had, you know, interesting. Well, much less profit. Much less profit, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, we had interesting numbers. We were the fastest growing service on the internet at the time in 99. But we had no money. We had no revenue. and. Uh, and again, we said the future looks bright. Um, we can't get our heads around this IPO thing. And then along came an acquirer, and uh, acquired us for far beyond what anyone ever conceived of. 
And so those two experiences have taught me, plus some other experience. Right now, for example, we talked about the, the climate. I'm on board of a company that's being courted quite a bit uh, because they're in the social software space and they're, they're getting a lot of momentum. And they're not interested in, in, in that. And that makes them that much more attractive. So the, my counsel to entrepreneurs and my experience is that you don't think about it. You just think about success. And, and you just keep focused on that. If someone approaches you while you're on the way to success, you talk about your business and how you're going to be successful. Uh, and then if you decide to engage in negotiations, then the kind of you're flipping into a different mode. But it, it's not something that, that I, I would lead with thinking about. I think one further comment on that, as somebody who's done deals for 30 years, is as an entrepreneur, you have to be careful about starting discussions about getting acquired uh, casually because the process of that quickly spreads throughout your company no matter how yes. hard you try to keep it uh, limited to the, just the very senior people. In the, and it's enormous, I mean, to Toby's point in a different context, it's enormously distracting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And even if the right decision at the end of the process is clearly uh, and, and obvious to the people involved in the negotiation that, that an acquisition shouldn't occur, uh, quite frequently there's a sense in the target company, the small company, of failure or loss or disappointment. And it can be very uh, damaging actually to the, the culture of a small company I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have about five or ten minutes left, why don't we have, if there are any other questions from the audience, why don't we uh, take those? Let me do it. Can, if you can hand the mic out. Hello. Uh, yeah, I just had a small question about um, the different forms of exits that are possible. So let's say you, you, you say yes and you want to go down that route of negotiating, uh, looking f to be acquired. Um, what are the different options that are you know, available in the UK versus the US? You know, there's earnouts, there's full acquisitions. What, it, what, it, what's out there? I can tell you didn't listen to anything I said. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can take a quick stab at it. I, I mean, it it very much depends on where you are in the cycle, right? And 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 what the business is. You know, if if Jigar is selling, you know, Sun Edison, it's a very different. Uh, thing than when I sold my company to, to um, but if you're, to Nokia, if you're a small entity, uh, meaning, you know, not big revenues and you're selling like we did on, on sort of, uh, on, on people and technology more than on revenue and business. In fact, if we had had a, a very, if we'd had a small business, if we'd had, a, say, $5 million in revenue, it would have been a liability for this particular deal. So, because you know, Nokia wouldn't have known what to do with such piddly little sums of money, and it would have just defocused the team and everything else. So, I think you have to be very clear on why the acquirer is interested in you. Then understand whether you're interested in them under those, you know, same same terms, right? So, if they are interested in your business that you're very proud of having built because you're a business school guy and you know you like to build businesses, then they might actually not be interested in your business, they might be interested in your technology, at which point you're probably out of a job, maybe happily so. Um, but if, you, on the other hand, they're interested in your technology uh, and, 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 you're trying, and, and you're trying to run, run a business, then it's, you know, it's, a different, it's a different thing. So now in terms of how it's structured, I always caution about, again, if you're standalone business, you can structure it on milestones around the business growth and then look at some synergy stuff, et cetera, in terms of the, the acquire. If you're if you're buying doing anything else, I always look at it and say don't put too much finesse around the actual milestone structures. Basically, make it you're here or you're not as the trigger. Because what's going to happen? You know, in my situation, we closed the deal two and a half months ago. I was supposed to work for a guy in Berlin and move to Berlin. The company reorg. I'm now still moving to Berlin, but working for a guy back in Mountain View, uh, in, in in Silicon Valley. And you know the. the and, and my role has changed, the, the business objectives have changed. If we had put milestones as associated with specific deliverables in place during the negotiation, A, it would have complicated the negotiations, and B, it, it now would have been mute already and everybody would have been unhappy. Right? And, you, and So make it very simple, uh, unless you have business metrics where you basically can say, you know, okay, if revenue goes from 50 million to 70 million, 
you meet your first tranche and, and then you but but you need control at that point as well in order to make sure that you can drive your business so it really i guess it's, it's a very much and it depends on the situation but get very clear on what on the motivations why they're buying you but i, but I do agree with julie though is that i mean you know i mean and you should ask whatever questions you want but it is a silly question um in that, in that um, <laughs> exits are, you know, I, 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 you yeah, <laughs> exactly. I, 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 exits are simply financing rounds. I mean, to say that, you know, it, I mean, if you're acquired, they're going to want you to stick around to actually, you know, keep it going, et cetera. So it's not an exit. It was just a, it was a financing round and it just happened to change the capital structure of the company. But it's, you know, it, it may not actually even be any wealth to you. Um, for three years at least. I mean, because you, know, you have earnouts and lockups and all sorts of other stuff that occurs. And so, I mean, I, I think the, I, I agree with Julie completely. I mean, talking about exits at all is just a colossal waste of time. I mean, it, it really is because it's, because the, the challenge that you have is that, is it, it's, it's just, it, I mean, particularly because the 90s, I don't think are actually very replicable. Um, and so what you're, we're trying to say is this panel should have never happened. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but I, but I don't agree with that. Well, that's because you're a banker. I don't, I don't know. They weren't for exits. Clearly, clearly we're deal guys. So it's all, uh, it's all about exits, right? right. But, uh, but uh, to, to support your question in your, in your defense, uh, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's, of course, so emotionally tempting to think about exits <laughs> All the time. I mean, we're surrounded by entrepreneurs in the UK. We're surrounded by, you know, we can't move for Alan Sugar. I mean, he's always in front of us driving his Rolls Royce. He's got, you know, property all across the world. And he's now the, you know, the government's advisor for entrepreneurship. But is he happy? He's absolutely happy. He's happy all the time. He's, the more money he makes, strangely, the happier he gets. But I, I'm going to challenge that because I think that is, that is a red herring that corrupts the uh, the original motivation of what makes a great entrepreneur and what it does is it attracts someone who's going to be attracted by that as the poster child for entrepreneurship it's attracting the wrong kind of motivation I would never invest in a company uh, that has an entrepreneur that, that goes into starting the company thinking about exits and I would never be a part of acquiring a company where that motivation is as it's being characterized here because I, I, when, when you acquire, unless you're, you just have IP mm -hmm. that's self-contained and it, it's going to fit in really nicely, it's the missing piece and you don't care about the people and it's, it's, it's kind of reached its final conclusion, it, it's, it's never an end unto itself uh, as a potential acquirer or investor uh, and as an entrepreneur from my yeah. perspective. S -s but then this if that is the case... will be continued tonight down, down <laughs> at, at the bottom. But, but if, I, if I may just add one <laughs> comment. I mean, if that is the case, then why, when I attend investor presentations, which I do with our clients all the time, are they always asked, without pretty much exception, you know, what's your plan for exit? I mean, VCs are put on this earth to give their money back. They deploy it, and seven to ten years later, they have That's to give it back. That's their job as VCs, but that should yeah. not taint the entrepreneurs. No, but they can't, they can't <laughs> help but do that because they continue to ask the same bloody question <laughs> all the time. So be, clearly be. entrepreneurs have to think about that yes. because it's like a, you know, is he a smart guy? Yes. Has he thought about his exit? Yes. <laughs> and so clearly, you know, you, you need to think through that. You do that for the investor presentation and then you, you, know, you forget about it. Yeah, but then you become addicted. Right. By the Why don't we uh, take a, a question from the audience? Thank you. My name is Inzbir Bodike from a VC servicing firm based in London. I don't mean to be controversial, but I'd have to agree with you. What, what I do with VC, um, VCs and private investors is I look through business plans and work through potential deals that I present to these VCs. And something I do get a lot when I do speak to VCs is, you know, they want to know that the businessman has considered, or the entrepreneur has considered, an exit plan. So it's, if I can use the sort of writing analogy, if someone's writing a book, Obviously, they're looking to write a good story that's going to, to sell, but they've got to keep one eye on Hollywood. So with the entrepreneur, I think it's important to focus on being cash flow positive, focus on generating revenues and having a successful business. But it's also important to factor in to consideration. And 
So since I started this, let me yeah. uh, just kind of mm -hmm. elaborate a little. So I'm, I'm overstating it to make a point because what I see is there's an overfocus on exits. Mm -hmm. And it's not that they don't have their role. The role, when, when an investor says, what's your exit plan? Of course, as an entrepreneur and CEO, you need to be thinking about exit in the sense, it's a way, it's code for asking, how would the market value this? And, and who would be interested in this? How would the market value it? How, what's the return on the investment going to be? And what I'm just trying to say is that the way to get to that answer isn't to, try to shortcut by having this obsessive focus on how do I get acquired? Because there's, if, if you're successful, what you do, that's the best recipe for an exit. That, that's really, I'm just overstating it to try to make that point. But, I, but your point is a good one. The, the venture capital community has pushed entrepreneurs to think in terms of exits. I, by the, the way, I, I've never used UK. venture capital. Exactly right. We didn't, we didn't use VC money either. Mm -hmm. I think in infrastructure, VCs are mm -hmm. crap. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to have to just take my coat off because I don't want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> we, went, we, went, we went with a private equity firm um, because they're, they're looking you know, at a different, a different part of the value chain. Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm from biotech industry. Um, as this is, might not be a good time for being acquired, but uh, if licensing is an alternative option uh, right now, and how do you see um, in, the, in, the, in the following several years, is licensing a good opportunity? And what's the pros and cons? Thank you. Um, I do quite a lot of work in the biotech industry, actually. And what we've seen this year in the UK was there was a lot of acquisition, but it was consolidation. So you saw smaller biotechs being snapped up by big pharma. But I don't work, I don't myself do the licensing stuff. I do it with the corporate acquisition. But licensing is becoming more popular, I think, it is fraught with its own difficulties and problems, and one of those is this issue about milestones. Um, in that, at the outset of a licensing deal, what can seem like you know, sensible markers in the sand might not necessarily be down, down the track. So it is definitely an option for monetizing for biotechs. Um, a lot of them use it, but, but, but it has its own raft of problems like, like any any commercialization strategy? Yeah, licensing and strategic investments kind of in the same, you know, uh, the same bucket. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very, um, I'm very skeptical of because it, again, it very much depends on the life life cycle. But oftentimes it'll tie you into one partner, and that'll actually preclude a lot of other things down downstream. So, um, I, I, you know, it seems like. This company, Plum, I, I did for four and a half years, pretty much touched on every one of these. We did a big licensing deal with Hewlett Packard, and it, it was near death. I mean, Hewlett Packard reorganized, um, same, same thing actually, two months after we did the deal. <laughs> Hewlett Packard reorganized, so and, and the, the two guys above the guy I did the deal with um, uh, got nixed, reporting all the way up to Herd, the CEO. Uh, the guy above the guy I did the deal with, you know, the guy I did the deal with had to sort of prove he was tough, and so he had to get back and renegotiate. And it, it, at the end of the day, it, it got very close to being our, a sudden death on, a, on what we thought was a really good and interesting strategic mm -hmm. investment. So I, I, I just, and I knew this in the back of my head. I'd experienced this before. I knew it all along, but it just it looked a little too good to be true. Hewlett Packard <laughs> validation, millions of dollars, no dilution, you know, all the sort of check boxes. And then, but it doesn't feel right. And two and a half months later, I knew why. After eight months of negotiation, by the way. So I, I, it's, it's um, something I tend to caution uh, people I talk to about, but, but there are notable exceptions and good ones as well. Why don't we take one more question if we have someone. Yes. Uh, my, Mike Butcher from, uh, I write uh, a network blog for TechCrunch, TechCrunch Europe. Um, don't worry, I'm, I'm, I'm just shooting the breeze. Don't worry, it's not on the <laughs> um, But uh, you it and I, I, it might be slightly counter to YouTube. some of the conversations. And I, I also agree with you that I think that you know that entrepreneurs often should really just think about the company and not think about the exit and etc. But with a thought experiment, uh, <laughs> with the um, recent acquisition of Doppler by Nokia. Back in the day, Jaiku was bought by Google, and Jaiku was supposed to be the next Twitter, and bang, off it went. Um, do you think that, that uh, companies should often, or entrepreneurs, should actually think about the company that's kind of going to acquire them when they're building towards 
you know, <laughs> bet building towards. I mean, I, obviously they should focus on the you know the <coughs> metrics of the company, those, the, all those kind of things. But I mean, it was quite clear that Doppler was Doppler was built by a bunch of ex Nokia people who just talked to Nokia all the time for two years constantly, and then were bought. Lo and behold, surprise, surprise, bought by Nokia. I mean, is what do you think? Well, what I think is when you're. This is again another way of saying who's this valuable to. And if you use that as a guiding guidepost, either you say I can be independent forever and that's fine, that's my objective, or who's this valuable? Who might this potentially be valuable to? And the longer the list of people, the the more solid your strategy is. It's a it's a highly risky strategy. It doesn't mean you won't succeed. Highly risky to build something that's going to be valuable to one guy or two guys or. Uh, but if, if you know the more legs you have on what you're doing, right? Is it who might? It, it's a 10, 20, 50 companies. This might be valuable to. Then it's a much more solid, uh, uh, less risky business. So that's the role it plays in sort of terms of developing strategy, uh, e even in the earliest days of inception. When when I was starting my last company and the the, the companies before that I'm involved with, we, we always thought about that. <coughs> who might this be valuable to, and to yeah. whether it's strategic partnership or acquisition potential. Yeah, in the, in the solar industry, it's actually quite funny because every single stock analyst in the solar industry is a tech guy, as opposed to an energy guy, and uh, and so so it's just really massively weird because the you know the tech guy sort of is is I think I mean technology in the energy business is is not interesting, right? I mean, the energy business, if you look at Shell, Shell actually has an edict which says that it has to have, it has to have 100,000 hours of runtime before they scale it up, right? 100,000 hours for a technology is a lot of years. And so, <laughs> and, yeah, and so, you know, so for, so, so for, you know, so it was really weird, but for me personally, I, I was deep into energy. I mean, I knew everybody at AES and Calpine and Merrant, and I knew what all the independent power producers were doing and others. And so, to the extent that I was, you know, looking at an exit, it was more around just sort of saying, well, what is it that I don't have that they have that I need to acquire in terms of um, access points and skills? And, you know, and is it better for me to build it in house or partner with somebody to actually get those? those skills and that kind of stuff. I mean, I was focused far more operationally on those. But I agree. I mean, the guy, MEMC, who ended up buying us um, was something that we figured out two years ago that, that it, was, it, it, was, it was something that th they could bring to the table because we had very long-term contracts on, on solar panels which had become volatile because of commodity prices on silicon. And because they're the third largest manufacturer of silicon, if we we're doing long-term deals with Walmart, et cetera, we could actually guarantee our price points way into the future by having you know them as um, a partner. But I went to them as a partner, not as an acquirer, um, to try to figure out how we actually lock in commodity prices. So um, we're out of time. Um, I'd like to thank the panel and ask the audience to join me in.